chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. In those days, as the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews, that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. Then the twelve surrounded some of the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching about God to handle financial matters. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching ministry. The proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Herminus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. As we've been looking at the early church, one of the, one of the undeniable characteristics of this early group of followers of Christ was their willingness to serve one another. But we read in our text today that they've actually kind of hit a bump in the road as it relates to serving, and it had to be addressed. Now, it's important for you to kind of understand the context of what's being, what's, what we're hearing about as it relates to Hellen, Hellenistic or the, the Hellenistic Jews as opposed to Hebraic Jews. There were Hellenistic widows, that is, widows that are Jewish but living outside of Jerusalem. These are Jewish widows who had come to faith in Jesus. Christ and now they were part of the church but they were from Greek countries, not Israel itself. And they were being overlooked in the daily service of food or care that was being, that had been prescribed for them as widows. Now Jewish law was very, very big on caring for widows. It mandated that widows who had no other means of support or family nearby had to be cared for by the community of believers. For the community itself, even in non-believing Jewish communities, the synagogue was the place where widows would be cared for. It's interesting to understand that to be buried in the land of Israel was always and still is a very virtuous thing for, for faithful Jews. So any foreign Jew living in the diaspora or spread out outside of the land of Israel, they would hope to, and many would make their every effort to come to their land and spend their last days in the land of the promise that God had given to them as a people. And so what would happen is they would come and many would die leaving their widows behind in the land of Israel, in Jerusalem. And, and, and they were there as foreigners, so to speak, although they were part of the same people of faith, but they didn't have the community support necessarily because they weren't, they weren't from Jerusalem. They weren't Jerusalem Jews. It was interesting to, to understand, it's interesting to understand that rabbis would, would be so emphatic about Jewish people coming home, and even today they still are, about the return of the Jewish people to, their, to the land of Israel, that they would tell them, they would teach them, there was a tradition that, that arose among some rabbis that said that the resurrection to life would only happen to those living in the land of Israel. It was an incentive to get them to come back home. And so it, they would tell them that if you don't die in the land of Israel, that, you, that your, your, your dead body will have to roll its way underground <laughs> to get to the promised land so that you can experience resurrection. Well, so it was a big, big deal. The whole point of telling that was that it's a big deal for them to be in the land of Israel. And so, so the widows were there because their husbands were there or because their families were there. But many of them that we're reading about here in Acts 6, they didn't have family to care for them. And so you have this disproportionate number of foreign Jews, Jewish widows living in Jerusalem. And there seemed to be this great care that was offered for the Jerusalem widows because they were well known to everybody. But some of the others were forgotten because they were outside of the normal circle of people that had been born and grown up there. <coughs> So, in order to make sure that their needs were met, somebody had to oversee the distribution of food and to serve the table of the widows. So they decided to select seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and of wisdom to put in charge of this task. And these men are identified in verse 5. The first man in the list is the only one about whom we know anything, really, in great detail. <coughs> His name is Stephen, and it says that he is a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And he becomes the main character in the narrative of the next chapter and a half. Chapter 6 and 
in the rest of chapter 7. We'll come back to Stephen as we wrap up today. But verse 6 says that they lay hands on them, which was a common act in the Old Testament. It was communicating an anointing or an ordination to a place of high service. Rabbis, when they were, rab when they were ordained, they would go through the process called semikos, S-E-M-I. This is in your notes, and it really is nothing that you really would need to write down, but it's a, they would lay hands on them. They would go through this ritual, and it was considered a high honor to be, to be anointed with, your, with hands being laid on you. And so what we see here is the apostles bring these seven men forward, and they lay hands on them to simply serve. And what you see in this is that to the, to the early church, serving was a big deal. To be a person who was called, to be a person who was anointed, to be a person who was ordained to serve was high on the priority list. So much so that they brought them forward and they anointed them, they laid hands on them to set them forth. Now in our current context, serving is something that seems to be somewhat antiquated. But we don't like to talk about it a whole lot because we know serving equals sacrifice. Serving equals giving up time, giving up resources, giving up skills. There is, a, there is a price that comes with serving. At best, it's inconvenient. At worst, it's unattractive. It's not. Most people, most people don't like, genuinely like the concept of serving because it, 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 it puts you in a, in a place where someone else is depending on you or, or you're having to meet someone else's needs. And in a me-first world, it's not often seen today, sadly, as an authentic hallmark of the body of Christ. Now, let's be fair. We have plenty of churches that have serving Saturdays where a Saturday a month or every couple of months they'll do these big serving events. And you go over here and serve and we'll go over here and serve. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's awesome. If, they, if that's all that you do, then thank God that that's what you're doing. There's special serving events that give us the chance to check off serving off of our to-do list. But serving others, authentic servanthood, is something that we've all been called to. Not just seven of us, or twelve of us, or this side of the room and this side of the room is off the hook. No, we've all been called to be servers, to be servants. And as followers of Jesus, we are to be people who live as authentic servants. Real deal. Not people who serve so that people can say, oh wow, you've got such a good servant's heart. Not people who are serving so that, so that it, it looks good, but people who are genuinely driven to serve others. I want to say about our community of faith here that we have a good grasp of serving. If there is a need that is presented to the body of River Church, you serve and you serve well. But if we're not careful, we can kind of get comfortable in our history and say, well, we're good at serving. And so well, we, can, we can say, well, we, we did really good that time or that time. Well, we'll let someone else do it. And we can get lax. We can get lazy. We can get complacent in serving. And God wants us, the Father would have us to maintain, to live in a constant heart of authentic servanthood. So this morning, I want to walk you through what I believe are six signs of authentic servanthood. And we'll try to walk through those as, as quickly as possible. Number one, authentic servanthood is unconditional. Conditional servanthood expects that if I do A, then B, I can expect B to happen. <coughs> now listen, God does tell us that when we serve, that when we bless, that when we bless others, when we play, take on places, that He blesses our serving. He He He, he doesn't hide that, and then. And it's okay to trust His promise that He makes to us. But if our motivation to serve is to simply get, to simply as a means to an end, then our, our motivation is wrong, and that's not authentic servanthood. Jesus is talking in Luke chapter 6, verse 35. He says, But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing in return. We could unpack that verse for probably another 45 minutes alone because it goes completely against the grain of how we would think. Jesus really kind of complicates things here, doesn't he? He's telling us that we should serve others 
that we should lend to them, that we should do good to them, expecting nothing in return. But then he adds a little, but the whole, the whole command is kind of messed up a little bit because he's not just talking about the people we like, our friends. He's talking about our enemies. He's showing us that, look, you, I'm calling you to serve even those people that you wouldn't want to serve or that you think are worthy of you serving. People that you don't like or that don't like you, serve them and expect nothing in return. If anyone knows what authentic servanthood looks like, Jesus does because he himself is that, is that embodiment. He is the, is the quintessential authentic servant. And when Jesus says that authentic, here's what he says, that authentic serving is serving, expecting nothing in return. So it's the first sign of authentic servanthood is unconditional. <coughs> Secondly, an authentic, servant, authentic servanthood doesn't expect immediate return. It sounds maybe like what we just talked about, but let me explain it a little bit. I'm often saddened by the, by the reality when I see Christians who follow Christ for, for any length of time. And they grow complacent and lax in their serving. You ever notice how the new believer, the person that's brand new in their faith, they're, I mean, they're like wide-eyed with wonder. They want to do anything they can for Jesus. They, if, it, you know, if the church is open, I want to be there. If the church is going, to, I'm going to be there. If, 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 there's a, if there's a homeless person on the street, I'm going to give everything I got to them because I just want to, I just want to serve. I want to be like Jesus. You've been around those people. Generally, they're the people that have been that they're, they've been walking in the faith the shortest amount of time. It's true, and the people that have been walking in faith the longer amount of time are the ones that have kind of gotten maybe tired, weary, start looking around to see who else is not serving that should be serving. They're the, they're saying, well. I, I, I'm always there. I'm always signing up. I'm always. The one that's doing it. And, 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 and what causes people to, 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 to slack off? To grow weary in authentic serving? I think a lot of times it's because of unmet expectations. Because we expect maybe that we should have gotten more appreciation or acknowledgement for something that we did. Have you ever felt that? You know, you've never said it, but have you ever felt that? That, well, I did this. I kind of hope that I get a little bit more of a thank you or a... Or a pat on the back. That didn't happen. But that's a perfect little trap for the enemy to creep in and cause you to say, well, you know, don't do it next time. Leave it for somebody else to do. They don't give you the appreciation you deserve, then they'll look, they'll look thank you when you do do it again because they didn't appreciate you the first time. Or maybe maybe you, you did something and you expected big results and nothing happened. And you, and you have these expectations of something big coming out of something that you had done. And you're disappointed in the results. Or maybe, maybe you didn't find the fulfillment that you thought you would. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna feed the homeless people on Thanksgiving. That's just, I'm so excited about that. I'm gonna go serve and, and I'm gonna just feel so good about myself. I'm gonna go to the holidays, get the holidays off right with serving people, and you go do it and you come back and you don't feel as fulfilled as you thought you would. And so you say, yeah, you know what, that was fine. I'll put that on my little bucket list of charitable things that I've been, done this past year and, and move on. Listen, authentic serving bases itself on the love of Christ and His example of service. Not on, on, the, on the basis of what we feel or what we get. We are to serve for one reason and one reason alone, and that's for the sake of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 5-8 through eight says, Make your own attitude that of Jesus Christ, too. Existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for His own advantage. Instead, He emptied Himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when He had, be, when he had come as a man in His external form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What a, what a picture of a servant. He humbles himself, taking on the form of a slave. Jesus modeled servanthood, even in his death. And because of him being that example for us, because of our love for him, it should compel us to authentic servanthood. Thirdly, authentic servanthood is commanded. 
Jesus commands us to serve. Mark 10, 42. But it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to be great in the kingdom, or be, or be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He commands it. This is something that you have to pray about. I, you know what, I'm just going to pray and see if the Lord wants me to serve. No, 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 no we'll, we'll, we'll save some time. Don't, 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 there's much more important things to pray about than this because the answer is already clear. He calls us, He commands us to be people who serve. So if you're sitting around thinking, well, I'll serve when the kids get out of the house. I'll serve when I'm not so busy. I mean, my goodness, this holiday season... And I've got so much going on. I'll just serve my family. I'll just serve my relatives during the holiday season. I'll cook for them. I, listen, it, it's not just one area. It's not, it's not when it's convenient. It's a, he commands us to be authentic servants. Where servanthood becomes the hallmark of our lives. Serving isn't something that we can opt out of. I, 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 you know what? I'll choose to do it when it's convenient. No. It's characteristic of the life of the disciple of Jesus. Many of you have been able to participate in, in one of the ministry uh, operations that happen around our area. It's a strong, strong ministry here called Trace Diaz. It's, a, it's three days. It's, a, it's two weekends where uh, men go on one weekend and the following weekend women go. And there's a men's weekend going on right now. That's where Jacob is at this morning. He's serving <coughs> Um, Jamie will be there next weekend with the women. And, and some of you have been through it, and you know what I'm talking about, and others of you haven't. And I'll just say to you that this is a, a fantastic opportunity, A, for you to, to experience grace and, be, and to witness grace in a way that, that is presented in such a unique way. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about it, and, and it seems a lot of people say, well, it's just so secretive. And well, it's not really that it's secretive. It's just that there are so many interesting surprises that happen along the way for it to be truly impacting for you. You kind of go, not really knowing what to expect, and you walk away saying, wow, that was, that was huge. But one of the things that was so impacting for me on a weekend, on the weekend that I went through and, and, and subsequent weekends that I've served, is the, is the characteristic of serving, of servanthood, authentic servanthood, that takes over when you're there. Now, going through is phenomenal, but, but and anyone that's actually worked a weekend, they can, they can describe it as, uh, equally, I think, as impacting as to, as to be involved in this collective response of serving, sacrificially serving people that you don't know and that don't know you, and serving in ways that they don't even know that you're serving. And they don't, they, they don't find out until after that. You, you were doing that for me the whole time, and I had no clue that you were serving me that way. I, I love it, and I think it's a powerful, powerful tool. I truly believe that this should be the halt. This should be what we as Christians are like all the time. Not just on a, on a special retreat weekend where it's sort of the in thing to do. No, this should mark our lives. Because it's what we've been, how we've been commanded to live. The fourth sign of authentic servanthood is spontaneousness. Authentic serving doesn't always fit into our daily schedule. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just sort of pencil in from 1 to 2 every day or maybe 9 to 11 every other morning that this is going to be your serving block that, that God, I'm available. If you can use me to serve, I'm going to pencil you in right here, okay? So you bring anyone you want to to me, in that window of time, my, my sleeves are rolled up and I'm ready to go. Well, it doesn't work that way. Oftentimes, I've found in my own life that the interruptions for serving are never, never expected. It comes probably at the most inconvenient time. It comes at the time where it's like, ah, I, I, I need to do this, but I see the need here. And I'll be honest with you, there have been plenty of opportunities that I've missed simply because I was more concerned about keeping my schedule. But authentic serving is serving even when our schedule is full, or when we're the busiest, or that we have the greatest demands on us. One picture that Scripture gives us of authentic servanthood is found in Genesis chapter 24. This is when Rebecca meets Abraham's servant Eleazar. Now Eleazar has been sent by Abraham to find 
a son, I mean a wife for his son. Now, Eleazar shows up into this land of Abraham's relatives, and he puts God on notice. He says, I need your help. I'm, going to, I'm asking for a sign. I'm going to go to the well, where it's a, it's a prominent place to find eligible young women, and I'm going to ask for a drink of water, and I need you to show me the woman that you would pick for my son, because I want her to offer me water, but then I also want her to offer to water my camels. And sure enough, Eleazar goes up to a well. He sees, he meets Rebecca. He asks Rebecca for water. She gives him some water, and then she offers to water his camels. Now, that seems like a small task, but what she was offering to do was a huge undertaking. Because camels can drink up to 53 gallons of water in three minutes. Wow. Okay, and so Rebecca would most likely have a clay jar that would hold about three gallons of water. So, so Eleazar, having her offer to water his camels, not just one, but ten. Ten camels. For one camel, she would have had to make 14 treks from the well to the camel until he got, he got full and happy. She had to do it 10 times. So, so that would have put her at about 140 trips back and forth carrying a three-gallon clay jar of water, delivering over 530 gallons of water. She didn't have an irrigation system. She didn't have a pump. She didn't have a water hose. She had a clay jar. And she said, I'll serve you. I'll feed, want, give water to your camels. Now, I'm pretty confident that Rebecca didn't show up at the, at the well that day thinking, well, I've got time on my hands. This is a great time, God, for you to use me to serve somebody. And, oh, look, there's a little old man that looks, looks kind of hot and weary. I think I'll, I'll offer to snow. I, she, I don't think that she, she planned it. I don't think it fit into her schedule. But she stopped what she came there to do, to serve. And this is a demonstration of authentic servanthood because sometimes authentic servanthood is serving right there on the spot. Where it may not be convenient, but the need is in front of you. And the question is, will you respond? <coughs> the fifth sign of authentic servanthood is that it's indefinite. Rebecca watered every camel. Genesis 24, 22 says, after, after the camels had finished drinking. It doesn't say that after Rebecca got tired, after Rebecca watered enough or what she thought was enough. It was after the camels finished drinking. Her serving didn't stop until the job was done. Many people will start out to serve in a particular area, whether it's a ministry in a local church or maybe it's outside the local church. And they'll grow weary in the process. It stops being fun. It stops being glamorous. It gets tiring. It's thankless. If there's no the, the attaboys and the accolades aren't coming through in the middle of the night when you when 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 you're tired and you're weary. And the easy thing to do is that when the fun fades away and when the glamour seems to go away, that you would it would be easy for you to throw in the towel. You know what? I think I, I don't feel led to serve anymore. But true authentic servanthood sees a task through to the end. True authentic servanthood says, This is what I feel like the Holy Spirit has called me to do. And this is what I'm going to do until I know that I've come to the end of the job. Jesus is the best example of this kind of authentic servanthood, serving until the end, according to John 13, 1. As Jesus is nearing hit the time of his crucifixion, it says, Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Aren't you thankful? That Jesus didn't give up in the middle of the task that he came to accomplish. I'm so thankful that when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and the sweat that was pouring from his head was like drops of blood. I'm so glad that in the moment that he said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass for me. But if not, <coughs> not my will, yours be done. He could have gotten up, walked away and said, no, I can't do this. I don't feel led to do this. I'm going to let someone else take it over from here. But he didn't. He saw it through to the end. And that's the picture of authentic servanthood that he calls us to. It is to, is to see it through. Authentic serving is serving to the end. And finally, authentic servanthood 
very similarly, is faithful. One of the most beautiful pictures of authentic servanthood is the night Jesus, when he's betrayed, that he, he washes the disciples' feet. In the same context of John 13, Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he'd come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, he laid aside his robe, he took a towel and he tied it around himself. Next he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet to dry them with a towel tied around him. Why don't you take a minute with me? You have this particular verse in your notes. I just want you to underline the verbs that you see in John 13, 3 through 5. A little grammar, verbs are action words, right? In case you've forgotten that from school. So here's what I want you to look. Let's look read through. Jesus in verse 4, he got up from supper. Verse 4, laid aside his robe. He took a towel and he tied it around himself. He poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet and he dried them with a towel tied around him. See what Jesus did here? Jesus went to work without a word, quietly, humbly serving. Now, he had every reason to be speaking because Luke actually, verse chapter 22, records the same, the same meal, the same uh, the, the order of events, but there's something else happening that Luke records that John doesn't record. And earlier on, before the meal, the disciples are having this discussion, there's this argument over who would be the greatest and where they would sit and, 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 and where, where they were going to sit at the table. A lesser man than Jesus would have reacted in a lesser way because he would have he would have Likely, if it would have been me, got an or really? Are you, we, we, have, we have this sort of dilemma that happens at our, at our house a lot with our, with our younger ones, our younger kids. And that is, who's going to get to sit next to a parent? It doesn't, it doesn't happen as they get older as much, but, 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 but we, sit, we put the plates out at the table and we go to sit down and, no, you sat next to a parent last night. Tonight's my night to sit next to a parent. And I'm, I'm flattered, and I think that's really cool, but I think if we're all sitting around the same table, and so oftentimes Chris and I will be like, really? I mean, there are more, there are, there are better things for you to fight about than <laughs> who's going to sit next to one of us at the table because we can all interact with one another. The same thing was happening with the disciples, and Jesus, he very well could have said, come on, boy, snap out of it. What are you thinking? This is, this is stupid. But instead, he gets up. He, he, what do we see? He gets up. He lays aside his robe. He takes on a towel. He ties it around. He pours in water. He washes and he dries. He gets to work. He serves them first. Then in verse 12 of chapter 13, John says that when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe, this is the first time you hear him saying anything in this whole context. He reclines them and he says, do you not know what I've done for you? It's almost like a question I hear. This is desperation in this voice. It's like he's implying, guys, time is running out. Do you not know what I've done? Can you not get it? I've done something here, and I want you to understand. You've been worried about who gets the, the seat of honor, and those are the things that, 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 that those who don't walk with God worry about. But what you need to understand is that those who are, what this is what it looks like to be the greatest in the kingdom. It's the one who serves. It's the authentic servant who will be greatest in the kingdom. Listen, authentic serving is faithful serving when we are the busiest, when we would rather do something else, when no one notices or pays us back. It's doing it anyway. Authentic servanthood is faithful. So chapter 6 and 7 of our text this morning, they tell us about Stephen, one of the seven chosen to serve. Now we don't know much about the time trend, the trend that transpires between chapter between verse six, where hands are laid on him and anointing him and the other six for prayer. But verse eight tells us that Stephen is accused of blasphemy, and so Stephen speaks in, a, in, a, in chapter seven this very long sermon in his, in his defense until the end of chapter seven, where his accusers end up stoning. Stephen, a servant. 
one who was anointed for service. Now, I realize that Stephen's demise does not necessarily create this awe-inspiring call to want to serve. Well, he got stoned for serving. Why would I want to even do that? If authentic serving should lead to stoning, I'm sure the line would be incredibly short, incredibly fast. But Stephen doesn't just demonstrate authentic serving and caring for foreign Jewish widows living in Jerusalem. No, Stephen demonstrates authentic servanthood by will willingly, fearlessly, unwaveringly serving God's great purposes, even if it cost him his life. See the picture of an authentic servant. It's Stephen's willingness to sacrifice himself. You see, Stephen's sacrifice would lead to a widespread persecution. As you read on in Acts chapter 7, a great persecution begins to come against the early church. But it's that persecution that leads to this great revival. And now, those that were in Jerusalem are no longer just in Jerusalem. There's a scattering that takes place. And there are, there are thousands that are coming to know Jesus as a result of this persecution outside of Jerusalem. And it's at this point that this gospel message that to this, to, to up until now has strictly been for the Jewish people living in, the, in proximity of Jerusalem. Now this message begins to eke out and comes to Gentiles like you and me. And because of Stephen's faithfulness, willingness to be an authentic servant, willing to lay his life down, his death is part of the beginning of a revival that begins to evangelize the whole world. It's interesting to note that at the end of chapter 7, that the ones who were stoning Stephen laid their coats at the feet of a man who was standing there watching. His name was Saul. And you read about Saul a couple chapters later because Saul gets angry and he goes on to persecute the followers of, followers of Jesus passionately for some time. We don't know how long. But then Saul has an encounter with, him, with Jesus himself. And when that happens, Saul becomes the greatest missionary to the Gentile world that has ever lived. It's his writings that make up the last section of our holy text. Saul becomes Paul, and Paul becomes this missionary and who stood there at this moment of, of authentic servanthood that he witnesses even with anger watching Stephen breathe his last. And Saul becomes Paul and becomes this follower of Christ. It all began right there at the death of Stephen, an authentic servant of Jesus. We know in our head that we're to be authentic in our serving. You could sit here this morning and say, I know, Shannon, I know, I'm, I'm good, I'm, I serve. And you could probably already, I, I, I dare say this, some of you sat here and thought, well, I mean, I serve here, and I do this, and I serve this, and I, and I lead this ministry, and, and, I, and, and you don't even know the things that I'm involved in. And serving. And, and if that's the case, I commend you for that. But do you know that you are to be an authentic servant in your heart? Because it's it's easy for us to know it in our head. It's it's like being told you need to do this. Okay, we're rule followers and we'll do this. This is what this just comes with the territory. But are you motivated from a place of authentic servant? Is it something that happens genuinely from inside? What is your motive in serving? If our serving is conditional, convenient, and comfortable, then I would, I would dare say that we're not an authentic servant. More importantly, our life of discipleship may lack some authenticity as well. I want you to hear me clearly when I say this. I'm not just talking about serving in places here in the local church. We have plenty of opportunities for you to serve. And if you're not, then I challenge you to find a place to serve. But I'm talking about more than just that. That's part of it. But there are plenty of places outside of the church to, uh, to, to serve. I hope that you understand that what happens here for two hours on Sunday morning isn't your only opportunity to be an authentic servant. Because authentic serving happens at home, with your family, on your job, in your community. Authentic serving is what God expects of every follower of Christ. This morning, I want you to uh, I'll give you an opportunity just to check your heart. Check your motives. I'll be real. 
very real with you, there have been more than one conversation that I've had with God. Or I've said to him, you not, did you, do you not see what I do for you? I, I, and, I'll, and I'll list out for him, God, I, 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 I've done this, and I've been here, and I've done that, and, I've, and, I, and, I, and I give here, and I sacrifice here. Do you, do you not see? Do you not notice? I've had those conversations with him. <coughs> And if those conversations are being driven, are happening inside of me so that I'm trying to get him to lighten up on me a little bit or make me make things better or, or whatever, and, and you know, to try to kind of change the, the, the course of, of what's happening in my world, then, then I'm not so sure that I'm living as an authentic servant of Jesus. God knows what we do. And he's not looking for people who are just looking to check off a list. He's looking for people who are able to go about their day and who will see people that they might even label as their enemy and say to them, I want to serve. How can I serve you? It's as simple as opening a door or maybe letting someone over in front of you in a traffic line. And it can be as complicated as stopping and saying, hey, let me, let me take you to some food. Let me give you a ride. Let me, let me help you get what you need. You look anyway. It's not, it's not so much concerned about what it looks like. The act itself. He's concerned about what it looks like from the heart. He's looking for authentic servants of Jesus. Thank you.